This is intentional behavior to deceive and falsify the record in one way or another. Preventing ballots from being counted, counting false ballots, manipulating the statistical figures that you turn out, whatever it may be. So this thing is a criminal case. And it's amazing to me that it hasn't been handled as a criminal case to begin with. AOC is telling us they're going to drop lists of enemies of the people. Any prominent person who supported Trump is going to be on AOC's list. Well, now you're talking about neo-Bolshevism. Right? That's exactly what the Bolsheviks did. That's exactly what the Nazis did. That's exactly what any totalitarian government does when it gets into power. It draws up a list of its enemies and then does bad things to them. So are we hearing this? So you see, this isn't simply a matter of the, that, the, the Nixon-Kennedy problem, the abstract problem of, oh my gosh, we'll have an illegitimate person in as president because he didn't really win the vote. Here we're going to have an illegitimate person in as president whose supporters are all demanding Bolshevik purges. And you will see even worse from the media, and you will see worse from, the, from big tech. Big tech is certainly not going to be reined in in terms of its censorship and its manipulation by a Harris-Biden administration. It'll be exactly the opposite, same with the big media. If the systems of due process which already exist can be thwarted, not just circumvented, because normal vote for it is circumvention. It's done secretly, and you really are supposed to never find out about it. This is, as I said before, in your face. There's no, they predicted this was going to happen. They did it. And they're now saying, too bad for you. We got away with it. Now, what is the due process system for dealing with that when the people who got away with it then end up in control of the highest offices in the country. There is no constitutional method specified for throwing these people out if they get away with fraud and nobody, the judiciary, the Congress, the state legislatures, if they are all thwarted in overturning this criminal result. There is no due process provision in the Constitution for dealing with it. There's due process provision in the Declaration of Independence for dealing with it. But see, we go to a different we go to a different level of law here. Is it really that much in their interest in the short term to create this situation in which all constitutional bets are now off? Where do those situations generally lead? They lead to some kind of political slash social slash economic crisis in which there is a real honest to God coup by the military. The military steps in to restore order, usually temporarily, right? That's always their story. We'll just do it for a while. And then they never leave. And that's the danger here. These people have played with fire because they've undercut the legitimacy of the entire bloody system. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have a distinguished returning guest. Dr. Edwin Vieira is a constitutional attorney. He's here with us to discuss questions about due process for constitutional elections, and there's certainly enough to talk about in that regards right now. Today is Monday, November 9th, 2020. Dr. Vieira, thank you for joining us again. Oh, my pleasure. In the wake of the U.S. presidential election between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, we've seen this swirl of controversy both before and now especially during and after the actual election about the potential for inappropriate process being followed, the potential risk of tampering or swaying of the vote, uh, whether in fact the results were prematurely announced or called by major media outlets, and even now whether in fact there is still another shoe that's going to drop and whether people should keep their conclusions at bay as due process happens or whether this has gotten so muddled that it's not going to be possible for the proper process. We'd like you to walk us through that in an orderly manner, at least understanding what the proper process is supposed to be. But in the face of that, we've got a range of fairly high-profile people weighing in on it. On the one end, you've got South Dakota Governor Noem saying, let's let due process take its course as it did previously with the Bush-Gore election. We have Judge Janine Shapiro, who had a show canceled by Fox News because evidently she was going to come out strongly pro-Trump 
and questioning the validity of the election process. And she posted privately on social media yesterday saying it's not over till it's over. We've heard and seen a transcript uh, circulating from a Dr. Steve Pazenik saying that this whole thing was really a sting operation and it's a double reverse sting on the part of the Trump team because they've done high integrity watermarking using a block chain traceable on every ballot out there so they'll be able to tell where all the real ballots and not real ballots and they've got National Guard troops in place to enforce all this. So we've got just this range of, of responses. Could you bring us down to earth and give us your view of what the process is supposed to be by the Constitution, whether it's being followed as far as we're aware or what remedies need to happen to get us back on track? Well, it might be a good idea to go back in history to the Nixon-Kennedy election, 1960. And those people who were alive then and paying attention remember that Nixon lost that election by very close vote nationwide. And Illinois was the key state. Illinois went for Kennedy. And as a result of Illinois, uh, Nixon lost, or at least that was the perception at the time, that if Illinois had gone the other way, it would have been a different story. And no doubt Nixon was importuned by some of his advisors to challenge the result in Illinois because there was widespread suspicion that there had been a great deal of vote fraud, especially coming out of Chicago and the environs of Chicago, engineered by the mob. The claim was that uh, John Kennedy's father, Joseph P. Kennedy, who had had some questionable business dealings during the 1930s, uh, had friends in the mob and had arranged for uh, that election to be fixed. Dead people coming out voting in Chicago was the classic example. In any event, Nixon took the position, uh, apparently privately, I mean, he didn't come on the air and state this, but the story was he, he took the position that, no, it would be a constitutional crisis if he challenged the election of Kennedy, the supposed election of Kennedy, on the basis of some kind of engineered fraud involving the mob and Kennedy's father or whatever. Okay, and that's what happens, and Nixon let it go. And only, in a sense, the Cognoscenti were aware of what was behind the scenes and all of that. And you think about that, going back to that, you say, well, which would be the worst constitutional crisis? Challenging an election on the basis that, uh, you know, Kennedy's entourage, whether it was father or others, uh, arranged for vote fraud, and vote fraud's something that's gone on in the United States throughout its history. Or allowing someone who was not legitimately elected to serve as president of the United States. Mm -hmm. In which case, everything that he did would be illegitimate because he wasn't properly elected. And one would think that it would be the latter rather than the former. You certainly don't want the, uh, the precedent there that an illegitimately elected or an Ill ineligible person should be able to take over the office of president. Well, okay, here we are now. And we, we're in the same type of situation, except uh, Trump apparently is going to challenge this election on the basis of voter fraud. And let's go back a little politically. The Democratic Party and its supporters have been going after Trump, actually even before he was elected, but let's just say from the day after he was elected. And they've run one kind of conspiracy after another. They ran the Russia uh, in, interference, election interference conspiracy. They ran the Ukraine telephone call conspiracy. They ran the impeachment farce. They ran the Mueller investigation and on and on. They ran the Flynn frame-up. That was the first part of it, the Flynn frame-up. They ran all of these things against Trump. And as a result of notwithstanding that they were exposed in one way or another during the course of the past four years, nothing happened. Not a single one of those people in the FBI, the DOJ, that ran this operation, not Hillary Clinton, not Barack Obama, not the other people, political figures that were privy to it or actually behind it, 
None of them has been indicted, let alone convicted. The only person who was indicted and falsely convicted in a framework was General Flynn. Hmm. And even that hasn't been turned around, notwithstanding that all of this exculpatory evidence was finally unearthed by Sidney Powell. Not by Flynn's original attorneys, but by Sidney Powell, who came in after the fact and discovered what should have been discovered at the very beginning of the case, because that's one of the first motions that any defense counsel in a criminal case files, a so-called Brady motion, to the prosecutor saying, turn over all the information you have or that you're capable of collecting, which exonerates my client, or potentially exonerates my client, mm -hmm. what they call exculpatory evidence. If you have it in your file, turn it over. If you know where it might be or where you can search for it, go get it. That's a constitutional requirement. Okay. So we've seen four years of the Trump administration of utterly feckless behavior by everyone, all the way to Trump himself, because Trump, under the Constitution, has a duty to take care of the laws, be faithfully executed, Article 2, Section 3. Mm -hmm. all right. So he let this all go on. So now we look at this huge fraud operation in the election, and I'm not going to say that who committed fraud or whether there's a huge amount of suspicion. And at this point, you don't need proof beyond a reasonable doubt. You don't need clear and convincing evidence. You don't need a preponderance of the evidence. You simply need reasonable suspicion to start an investigation. If there isn't reasonable suspicion in this case, I don't know what reasonable suspicion might be. And what's happened? Well, thank goodness Sidney Powell came in on this because she's a reasonably hard-nosed and, and pragmatic person. She's not going to fool around. But the main thrust of everything that's been done coming out of the Trump administration has been, oh, we want a recount, we want uh, the mail-in ballots disqualified if they came in after the, uh, you know, the day of the election and, and so forth. All of these classical civil remedies for vote irregularities, let's not even use the word fraud, for irregularities. Because when you start talking about fraud, you're not talking about criminal conduct. This is not mistake. This is intentional behavior to deceive and falsify the record in one way or another. Preventing ballots from being counted, counting false ballots, manipulating the statistical figures that you turn out, whatever it may be. So this thing is a criminal case. And it's amazing to me that it hasn't been handled as a criminal case to begin with. Because everything that's been done to Trump in the past was part of a huge criminal case. A huge conspiracy. Actually, this thing goes back to Title 18 of the United States Code, Section 241, 242. Uh, if, you, if, if someone attempts, especially on the color of law, attempts to deny another person or succeeds in denying another person his civil or constitutional rights, that's a federal criminal act. Ten years in prison is the sentence for a single uh, act of that kind. So what have they been doing to Trump for the past four years? Well, they've been trying to deny him his civil and constitutional rights as the person who was elected president, mm -hmm. as the person who was in the office of president, and now as the person who is trying to be reelected as president. They're also trying to deny the, the, the United States government the legitimate individual in the office of president. And that's a conspiracy to defraud the United States, obviously. That's Title 18 of the United States Code, Section 371. Every count there is a five-year sentence. Then we have such uh, what I would call run-of-the-mill criminal charges with, relating, with relationship to elections. Title 52 of the United States Code, Section 20511, Part 2, Subsection 2. Anyone who knowingly and willfully deprives, defrauds, or attempts to deprive or defraud the residents of a state of a fair and impartially conducted election process, and then it goes through various things that could be done, procuring false ballots, so forth, gross from voter registration, etc., shall be fined or imprisoned for five years. So let's just take one vote, one fraudulent vote, that someone under color of law, because all of these local election officials are acting under color of law, one fraudulent vote would get you, just under the, these four statutes, would get you 20 years in prison. Well, how about a thousand votes? That's a thousand times twenty. That's twenty thousand years in prison. How about five thousand votes? 
That's 100,000 years in prison. You're talking about serious problems here when a single individual could be sent to prison for 1,000 years based on what is now being bantered around as having been done. And we're talking about all the way down to the lowest individual, the one who, who, who schlepped those boxes of ballots in at 3.30 in the morning, the pictures that show these people coming in late, later, first thing in the morning, hauling boxes of ballots in, the vast majority, if not 100% of the ballots for Joe Biden, statistical impossibility. That fellow right there is facing just under these three statutes 20 years in prison. And that's simply counting one, one ballot. How many ballots were in those boxes? So I looked at this and I said, wait a minute, the way you should have handled this way before, I mean, I've been talking about this for years, when Trump realized he had this conspiracy on his hands and it was going on across the United States, he should have gone to Title X of the United States Code, Section 253, and began to energize that. Should have begun to energize that. And he could have done that in dealing with these various riots that went on throughout the country this year. He chose not to. He chose to let those people in a sense stew in their juice. And that was probably wise in the long run because it was a uh, essentially a state and local problem. But he could have organized under that particular statute through a secret executive order, a secret proclamation, in anticipation of what he knew or should have known was coming forward in this election because the Democrats essentially announced it. They kept talking about you know, Trump was going to produce some kind of fraud and so forth. Well, they, that's projection. They knew what they were going to do, and they were trying to get people through the media to believe that it was Trump who was the bad guy here. Uh, and that if Biden won, so-called won the election, any negative comments from Trump about fraud would be, in fact, his attempt to overturn the legitimacy of the election. So he failed to set this up to begin with which makes me wonder what the heck his advisors were doing, what they were smoking while he was waiting for the past six months for this election to come on board. Hmm. Well, now here he is. He has Sidney Powell. Sidney Powell came out the other day and said she, she at one point she had 400,000 votes. She said they could prove were ineligible or fraudulent or whatever, but shouldn't have counted. Uh, so one hopes that uh, she'll put some backbone into these people. But I look at Giuliani, he was there the other day talking in Philadelphia about how the poll watchers from the Republican Party had been kept out of the counting rooms at the convention center, I guess. I think that was the one where they showed pictures of the Democrat people inside putting up, taping pizza boxes to the windows so that the poll watchers could not look in, and even from the great distance could not see anything as to what was going on. Well, if that isn't enough to convince a court that there's some real hanky-panky going on here, I don't know what it is that they would need. Uh, so you have a sufficient amount of suspicion for a criminal case. And, and what was Giuliani talking about there, standing in front of, I guess, the convention center in Philadelphia? He was talking about these poll watchers. This civil, oh, we didn't have our poll watchers, now we have to go and, and follow these other civil remedies. Now, Giuliani, if you remember his history, made his reputation legitimately as a hard-nosed criminal prosecutor in New York. He went after, in a broad sense, the mob. And they were talking about corrupt uh, unions, corrupt public officials, money laundering, uh, bribery, extortion, all of these crimes that are, in many instances, very difficult to prove. All right. you, you get false uh, bills of laden for construction materials or, or the construction materials that are actually provided are not the high-quality ones, they're the low-quality ones, and somebody else is raking off the difference. And this is going on multi-millions, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of this kind of fraud going on in New York City, for instance, and all mob connected. And he was going in and prosecuting people and being successful under the RICO statute, mm -hmm. Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act. Right? So very familiar with highly complicated criminal activity, which, of course, vote fraud, engineered vote fraud. We're not talking about just one person in one county who's stuffing a couple of ballots in for his brother-in-law. 
We're talking about nationwide, systematic vote fraud. All right. This is on the level of things that Giuliani was doing in New York, because it requires statistical evidence, financial evidence, and a lot of other things to really to prove this. It's not enough to show that a couple of dead people voted in Arizona or Nevada, wherever the dead people were, that they found were voting. So what is Giuliani talking about? He's standing there talking about some civil remedies. That's why I look at this right now, and I said, these people are not realistic in the Trump administration. What they're facing here is a criminal conspiracy, a very high-level criminal conspiracy, to run a coup against the United States. And this is part five of the coup strategy that began at least the day after Trump was elected. So obviously he's being advised by the same feckless bunch of nitwits that caused him to waste four years in not getting a single indictment against all those people who were running all the other coups. And Flynn, by the way, the, the, the first person who was framed in this operation, he's still wondering what's going to happen to him because he's in front of that Judge Sullivan who's not going to accept the Department of Justice's request to have the case thrown out. They couldn't. I mean, Trump hasn't even been able to save Flynn after Sidney Powell proved that he had been framed. So I look at this and I say, what in heaven's name is going on? How are they going to get control of this? Well, what happens if they don't get control of it in, in the sense that I'm talking about, which mm-hmm. is starting a first-class criminal investigation? And by the way, this is what Trump should have said, and I told people at the time. As soon as people start talking about fraud in the election, he should have come out and said just what I said here today. Here are the statutes, ladies and gentlemen. These are just four. He could have probably put 15 or 20 various statutes, criminal statutes that would apply one way or the other. Come out on nationwide as a nationwide broadcast and say, this is the problem. If there's any voter fraud, these are the statutes that are going to be applied here from Washington, because they're all federal statutes. Hmm. And we are going to go after every single person that we find engaged in vote fraud. We're going to have an honest election or we're going to send a lot of people to prison for a long period of time. And all you folks down at the lower levels, the ballot box stuffers, the ones who are filling in uh, ballots illegally, the ones who are tampering with the mail-in uh, postmarks, all of you, all of you low-level people, think about if you want to go to prison for the rest of your life because somebody above you told you to do this. Mm-hmm. Because we'll certainly find you. We'll certainly find the people who are sitting at the tables where we have videotape of them filling in ballots. We'll certainly find you where we have videotape of you hauling the ballots in at 3 o'clock in the morning. And we'll prosecute every last one of you. So you better think about it right now. I think if he had said that six months before this election, the amount of fraud here would have been so small you wouldn't have been able to detect it. Because any conspiracy of this kind depends upon the foot soldiers, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the Mafia Don, it's not Don Corleone who goes out and commits the murder or or robs the bank or sells the drugs or whatever it may be. It's those foot soldiers at the lowest level of the system that make it work. So those are the people you have to depend upon, the ones who are hauling ballots in at 3 o'clock in the morning, the ones who are changing ballots, the ones who are changing postmarks, whatever they did, the ones who are putting up pizza boxes so that the poll watchers can't watch through the window. Those are the ones. And we know who they are. In every case, we know who they are. We may not know who gave them the order to do this. We may not know the chain of command all the way back to the top. But we know the foot soldiers. And the foot soldiers know who gave them the orders. They didn't do this spontaneously. They know what the score is. The guy who was taping up, I remember seeing this guy taping up the pizza boxes in front of the window. Who told him to do that? Well, somebody did. He didn't come up with that idea on his own. They lock the people out and then tape the pizza boxes over the window so no one can look inside. Well, now we saw a picture of him. It should be pretty easy to identify him and bring him in to an FBI investigation, if you could trust the FBI, and say, Bill, here's what you're facing. Oh, look at this. 5,000 years in federal prison. Can you tell me who told you to put those pizza boxes up? What do you think the answer will be? He'll sing like Luciano Pavarotti. Now, they, have it. they didn't do this, because obviously this kind of investigation is not going on. They found in some place, I think it was Arizona or New Mexico, 
that uh, you know, a number of people, I think it was New Mexico, because they were Californians who had escaped from California, and they were illegally voting in New Mexico. Mm. So they found some number of illegal voters of that kind, and they referred that to the Department of Justice. And I think there was some others, maybe in Arizona, some other states, where these, was, these referrals were made. But I'm not talking about referrals after the fact. I'm talking about a situation where you would have been in before the fact, which wasn't done. Mm-hmm. So now where we are, where are we? So let's say they go and they conduct these attempts to get recounts, attempts to uh, invalidate ballots because the postmarks were too late or whatever, and that doesn't work. Well, uh, there you go. If, if all of this is done before the Electoral College meets, then that's the end of the game. Uh, because the states will have certified the electors, and the electors will be you know, the 271 plus, whatever the number turns out to be, for Biden, and Biden will be the titular president. Now, you have all sorts of other scenarios by which this thing ends up going into the, into the Congress. That's your other alternative. If you don't have a sufficient number of electors, then it goes to Congress to determine who the president is. And this happened before. I think it was Rutherford B. Hayes that was the, the great uh, uh, reconciliation over Reconstruction. Hmm. And there was the Jefferson uh, Aaron Burr election. So been, there have been examples of this happening. And that is, quote unquote, due process by definition, because that's provided for in the Constitution. Right. A lot of people are talking about what I would call extra due process uh, situations where uh, the courts invalidate this or that in an unprecedented manner, and then what happens? Where are we? Do they do it before the electors, after the electors have met? And, you know, this is all extraordinary speculation. But the interesting thing comes down to, well, what, what if this is going on on the civil side and stuff is coming out on the criminal side? Then what happens? Is it conceivable... That the, and it's conceivable. I don't think it's conceivable. I don't think it's conceivable that the Supreme Court can stop the process if there is if there is not a, a, a valid election of the president because of all of these uh, what shall I say elements of confusion. Then what happens? Well, it goes to Congress, right? I mean, I, I I don't see how you're going to have any of these extra. Uh, constitutional uh, remedies sold because there already is one. There's a constitutional. There's a constitutional process. Let's call it a remedy. I don't know if it'll be a remedy uh, because it will not necessarily give us the answer that we would get if the fraud were totally exposed. But at this stage, you don't know because it's a matter of time. Now, I just give one example: is the is the problem with Pennsylvania? Yes that the the Constitution requires that election law be promulgated by the legislatures of the states. And that's the word the Constitution uses. It's legislature. So in Pennsylvania, the legislature had provided in a certain way for uh, mail-in ballots, and along comes the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and it rules as a matter of Pennsylvania law that mail-in ballots were going to be allowable, notwithstanding that the legislature had said something different. Hmm. And it went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court uh, tried to dodge it, I guess, hoping that maybe the problem would be solved by the way the, uh, the voting turned out. So there actually already is a case in the Supreme Court. They didn't actually decide that case finally. They said, we can't really decide it now, and we're just send this thing back and let's see what happens. So it's not a matter of having to go through the whole process of petitioning for certiorari once again, going up through the federal system. They already have that case in the Supreme Court. And Alito just entered an order the other day about segregating these questionable ballots so that there could be a quote-unquote recount, potentially all those ballots might be declared ineligible. So there we go. And so this Pennsylvania lead that the media claimed for Biden could evaporate overnight. 
And then, of course, you have challenges in, what are they, Michigan and Wisconsin, and also a question about Arizona. So depending upon whom you talk to, it's possible that the Biden lead in electoral votes evaporates, and Trump gains those electoral votes. And by the middle of December, when the Electoral College has to meet, Trump has over 271. So that's certainly one possibility. Then, of course, the other possibility is no, by the time the Electoral College meets, these questionable states somehow or other will have certified their electors for Biden, and the Electoral College will vote for Biden. Mm-hmm. And once again, you have the situation, I think it's in Pennsylvania as well, that the legislature is talking about passing some new statute under their authority to deal with the electoral vote coming out of Pennsylvania, which now raises another interesting constitutional question. Can the legislature negate what appears to be an electoral vote for uh, a sufficient vote in, uh, of the voters in Pennsylvania to give the number of electoral votes in Pennsylvania to Biden? Can the legislature come in and change that result? Okay, and These are all un- essentially unprecedented situations, so who knows? What I think is the important part here is going back to the Nixon-Kennedy business. It was the greatest mistake in Nixon's life, I think, that he made, was agreeing not to look into the fraud in Illinois and essentially to allow this concept to be accepted that in a presidential election, at least, you didn't want to open up Pandora's box with respect to that question, because who know who would know where that would lead? Not recognizing the the other side of the coin mm-hmm. that it's a worse Pandora's box to have an illegitimate person in in the office. It's it's a worse thing coming out of Pandora's box to have a legitimate illegitimate person in the office, and especially in this situation, because let's look at at Biden. Uh, uh, Biden certainly has something wrong with him physically, and I say physically because you know, I'm not claiming that he's mentally ill, but it's some physical problem, which is affect his ability, mentally and otherwise, mm-hmm. to perform the function of, of president. So who are you really getting if the Biden ticket is accepted as having won the election? Well, you're getting Kamala Harris. And where will that lead? All right. Well, we already know where that will lead, because they're already telling us. AOC is telling us they're going to drop lists of enemies of the people. Any prominent person who supported Trump is going to be on AOC's list. For what? Why is it on the list? Won't get a Christmas present? Or something else is supposed to happen? Well, now you're talking about neo-Bolshevism. Right? That's exactly what the Bolsheviks did. That's exactly what the Nazis did. That's exactly what any totalitarian government does when it gets into power. It draws up a list of its enemies and then does bad things to them. So are we hearing this? So you see, this isn't simply a matter of the, that, the, the Nixon-Kennedy problem, the abstract problem of, oh my gosh, we'll have an illegitimate person in as president because he didn't really win the vote. Here we're going to have an illegitimate person in as president whose supporters are all demanding Bolshevik purges. And you will see even worse from the media, and you will see worse from, the, from big tech. Big tech is certainly not going to be reined in in terms of its censorship and its manipulation by a Harris-Biden administration. It'll be exactly the opposite, same with the big media. So you're going to have Pravda and Izvestia, Pravda being the big media and Izvestia being big tech or vice versa. You're going to have the Bolshevik system of media. You're going to have the Bolshevik system of retaliation against your political enemies. And you're going to have some of the wildest political proposals, Green New Deal, heaven knows what, coming out of Washington. And I don't care what Biden says about his being a centrist. He's not going to be in control. In fact, I would wager that within eight months he'll be out of the office. Either he will resign because in good taste he has to realize that he can't function properly, or they'll remove him under the 25th Amendment as being unable to function properly. 
So that's what you're really looking at. So this is extraordinarily serious. This is much, much worse than the Kennedy problem, because at least Kennedy, when he came in, was not a radical Marxist in principle or in practice. And many people said, well, he was kind of left-wing and so forth. Well, maybe he was, but he did some good things, did some bad things. He would have kept us out of the Vietnam conflict. That was for sure. He wanted to back out of that. He gained the test ban treaty with Khrushchev, atomic test ban treaty, which is a valuable thing. So you can't say Kennedy was 100% a disaster or that Nixon would have been 100% better. But you look at the situation now, and once again, going back to Nixon and Kennedy, in certain places, the illegitimacy of the Illinois vote was broadcast. It was something that was there, but it wasn't made a big deal of. This thing is in your face, vote fraud. And if this goes through, then the whole principle will be established that, well, this is a government that can be obtained by fraud. That's one of the things we were really concerned about, uh, in addition to all the direct effects and all the policy effects uh, that can flow from this, is the degradation of the American people and our republic to third world status, the malaise that would fall upon us if we knew that our, not only our votes really don't matter, but that we are just beholden to the powers that be. People who have claimed that all along the way have been considered on the pessimistic side, but if that's just, as you said, in your face and it's there for us all to see, then how can we, how can we maintain any semblance of leadership in the international community or civil society domestically? Yeah, then, then what is the recourse? Because you mentioned at the beginning, due process. If the systems of due process, which already exist, can be thwarted, not just circumvented, because normal vote for it is circumvention. It's done secretly, and you really are supposed to never find out about it, right? This is, as I said before, in your face. There's no, they predicted this was going to happen. They did it. And they're now saying, too bad for you, we got away with it. Now, what is the due process system for dealing with that when the people who got away with it then end up in control of the highest offices in the country? Because certainly they're not going to throw themselves out, are they? That's what becomes fascinating about this. Because, of course, there is no constitutional method specified for throwing these people out if they get away with fraud and nobody, the judiciary, the Congress, the state legislatures, if they are all thwarted in overturning this criminal result. There is no due process provision in the Constitution for dealing with it. There's due process provision in the Declaration of Independence for dealing with it. But see, we go to a different we go to a different level of law here. Mm-hmm. It becomes a very dicey situation, and that's why you look at the Democratic Party and you say to themselves, "Don't they realize what they've done? Is it that much in their interest, short term? Because most of these people think only in the short term, right? Is it really that much in their interest in the short term to create this situation in which?" All constitutional bets are now off. Where do those situations generally lead? They lead to some kind of political slash social slash economic crisis in which there is a real honest-to-God coup by the military. The military steps in to restore order, usually temporarily, right? That's always their story. We'll just do it for a while. And then they never leave because they're always at least in the background, there's always a threat coming out of whatever it is, the you know, defense establishment, military establishment. South American countries are this way all the time. Mm-hmm. Sure, they put in their military comes in, they back off out, they put in some uh, figurehead civilian, but they're always lurking in the shadows, and if that civilian or others in his administration get too far out of line, the military can always step back in. On the present, well, we did it before. And that's the, and that's the Roman Republic. Right? That was Sulla, that was Marius, that was Caesar, that was Pompey. Go read the history of the fall of the Roman Republic. And of course, in modern times, there are many more examples, but the classical world gives you the classic example. And that's the danger here. These people have played with fire in a very, uh, well, dangerous isn't even the words, beyond dangerous, in manner. 
because they've undercut the legitimacy of the entire bloody system. So where does this lead? Well, as I said, it's going to lead to going to a different level of law, up or down. Okay, it can go down to uh, Venezuela, you know, South American dictatorships, you know, un- under you know, the cloak of elections. They've got a president, Maduro is actually a dictator. All right. Or the other alternative, which is the Declaration of Independence situation, is overturning of the whole damn system and reestablishment of something that approaches legitimacy. Mm-hmm. Difficulty in this country, look at how many people actually voted for Biden? We don't know. In percentage. I don't know. I don't know. But it's, probably, it's probably about the same who voted for Obama the two times, maybe the same as voted for the Clinton. Let's give it, let's give it that, that high. So it's, it's the middle 40s for sure. They're claiming he has over 50%, right? But it's the middle, let's give him the middle 40s somewhere. Forty percent of the population of this country is willing to accept an individual who gained office probably, maybe, by fraud? Is that a governable society? With forty percent of the population either because they are so ideologically driven or because they are so stupid would actually accept, knowingly accept someone for the highest office in the country who obtained that office through fraud. Or so dependent on handouts. Well, whatever it is. Okay, they could have been bribed. They could, they could simply be ignorant. They could be ideologically driven. Whatever it is, here's this group that will reproduce this system again and again and again, this situation. They can depend upon 40-something percent of the population to, quote-unquote, vote, whatever vote means, to vote for this candidate with the expectation, oh, yeah, he'll win because the other 5% he needs, he'll get by fraud. Which makes the whole thing fraudulent, right? Mm-hmm. Doesn't make the first 40% valid. The whole thing is fraudulent. So you, you have a society that is almost split 50-50 on the basis of the willingness to accept a fraudulent government. Well, if you have a fraudulent government, do you have law? I mean, is there any law, is there any legal theory in Western history that says, yes, fraud can be law? Or law is fraud, or fraud is law, however you want to express it? This is a contradiction in terms, right? Right. So here's the, this is the problem. I look at this and I say, my God, this thing is so serious. The, the, the long-term consequences, yes. you know, maybe it won't happen the first year of the Kamala Harris administration, it take them two or three years to really do something bad. I don't know. But the principle has now been set. And so I look at these Trump people, and I say, what in heaven's name are you doing? This has nothing to do, ultimately, with Trump. Right. It has to do with the future of this country. They've wasted four years. They've, they've allowed it to be accepted by the vast majority of the people that hidden elements within the bureaucracy... DOJ, FBI, CIA, whatever, hidden elements within the bureaucracy could thwart the elected president of the United States and attempt to destroy him, and nothing could be done about it. So we've already accepted that proposition, right? That any president comes in and he's, and he's subject to deep state manipulation and he can do nothing about it. Some voices have been all along, and prior even to this most recent administration, that when you see this baffling incompetency or unexplicable actions on the part of those in charge that does not seem to be in the best interest of the people or the country. People say, well, we're just really unfortunate that, they're, that they don't understand what to do. Others say, no, it reveals that things have gone much farther than is publicly admitted, and this is actually just controlled opposition, that there's a higher level scheme at play, and that this team you thought was all on your side that's acting incompetent was never actually supposed to be capable in the first place. Yeah, that's even that's that's the even worse situation. The situation I had in mind was a simple one of, here's this thing going on, and it turns out that that Mr. Trump was simply in, in, incompetent to deal with it. All right? He brought a bunch of people in with him who were incompetent to deal with it, or they were appeasers, or they didn't want to really rock the boat. They didn't want to create a real constitutional crisis, right? Along the lines of what Nixon did. 
And I can understand you know, Nixon, but I can't understand this. I can't. I mean, Nixon would never have t- uh, accepted this situation. What's going on for the past four years? But you notice the progression. First, it was well, some bureaucrats are going to stand up against Trump. This deep state's hard to get them out because mm-hmm. you know they're appointed. They're they're appointed. They're not elected. They're professionals, bureaucrats. Blah blah blah. Have all these excuses for that, right? And so he's he's doing other things to get around them, and he never was successful. But then they go to the next step, and they say, "Oh well, by the way, we have enough power through fraud to put some figurehead in as the president." Mm-hmm. You'll so you'll have a figurehead president, and you'll have the deep state running the agencies. And we don't, of course, know who's behind all of these people pulling the strings, but then you know, we can accept that something like that is going on. And they come right out and do it. That's what I find the amazing part of, of all of this is that on the other side, on, on Trump's side, he never came out and made the what I would call the fireside chat approach of Franklin Roosevelt. Remember Franklin Roosevelt, when he came in, he had something along the lines of the worst possible world facing him. There was a depression going. There had just been a huge bank collapse. He was elected in 1932. It was a bank collapse at the end of 31, going into 32, went into 33, etc. And people with the pictures you see, people lining up around the block trying to get their deposits out of these banks, which are failing. And so you had bank closures, bank holidays, they called them in those days. And what was the first thing that Roosevelt did? He held... Had he had a fire, what he called a fireside chat. This was the beginning of that process where he went on nationwide radio. They didn't have television, and he explained to the people in this first fireside chat why he was supporting the closing of the banks. And he told them, "Oh, ladies and gentlemen, you have to realize when you deposit money in the bank, the bank." doesn't put that money in a shoebox and keep it in the back room, put it in the safe. They loan that money out to other people. And the returns from that loan, you know, that's how they're paying you. So you have to wait. The banks have loaned this money out, and they need to get it back. You, if you, you can't take all your pot deposits out of the banks. They don't actually have the money. Explain to them how fractional reserve banking actually worked. Okay, it was a crisis. That was the theory of this. This was this crisis. He was taking executive control, getting this crisis under control through legislation, through proclamations, various things he did, which were considered extraordinary at the time. But the first thing he did was he went to the American people and explained why he was doing this. Now, he didn't, he didn't excoriate the bankers for being criminal conspirators. He said, well, this is one of those things that happens every now and then in, in the economy and banking. We've had a lot of instances of major bank fail- failures in this country over the years, in the 1800s and early 1900s. This was just another one, the biggest of all, but it was still just another one. But now, Trump is in the interesting position of, well, this is not just a normal phenomenon that's happened here. This is the most extraordinary series of events over a four-year period in the history of the United States. And at no time has he ever done what Franklin Roosevelt did. And at no time has he ever come forward and said, you know, the Constitution empowers me, imposes a duty on me to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And in the final analysis, I am not required to depend upon Bill Barr or Jeff Sessions or any of these people in the FBI or the DOJ or the CIA or whatever. I have a constitutional authority here, and I'm going to exercise it. And if I have to do that through these extraordinary statutes, which give me these special powers under so-called emergency situations, that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I'm wondering now. Uh, if, if all of this turns out to be a real chaotic situation in which somehow the Electoral College doesn't or, or can't function or it's challenged, the result of the Electoral College is challenged, and then the as well, what will happen in January when they're supposedly going to have the inauguration? Before that, will Congress have to step in? Will Congress claim to step in to do something? So you have you have rival interpretations. One interpretation says, well, the Electoral College actually voted for Biden because there were enough states that had certified this. Another person, no, the Electoral College 
was illegitimate what they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, you know, Congress's action, Congress shouldn't have taken the action it took because the Electoral College did what it did legitimately or, or vice versa. I mean, you know. So you have the permutations and combinations of problems. And then, of course, there's the Supreme Court in this. What are they going to do? What if you have not clear-cut majorities, but you have a case where it's a plurality? And then they also have someone for the concurring opinion on a different, a different theory. And you talk to lawyers about what those cases mean when you don't have a, a, a five to four. Mm-hmm. But it, it's four, one, and four. Or a four, one, and one, and three, or whatever it is, mm-hmm. some some combination, permutation combination that doesn't work out to an actual majority. What does that mean? So that's why I find that this is one of those situations. Somebody has to grasp that. Now, this is Alexander the Great and the Gordian Knot. Uh, you can't be sitting in front of the Gordian Knot trying to take it apart strand by strand. Because no one had ever accomplished that. Supposedly it was it couldn't be accomplished. It couldn't be accomplished. So what does Alexander the Great do? He comes along with the sword and he just cuts it. And that's what Trump really needs to do at this stage, I think. That the due process element here that's of most consequence is were these elections in in the various key states at least conducted in a fraudulent manner, criminally fraudulent manner. And you've got to prove that. And he's got to prove that at least to the level where he could convince the Supreme Court to enter some kind of peremptory relief, injunction, mandamus, prohibition, these various extraordinary remedies that can stop a process so there will be time to clear up whatever the controversial aspects of it are. Well, he's running out of time. Mm Mm-hmm. They're all running out of time, because when, do you like to, when does the Electoral College meet? In December, right? Yep. Okay, we've got a month to figure this all out. And meanwhile, the states are going to be vying internally for certification of the electors. So he's got 30 days. Let's just say, to, to be rough, he's got 30 days to get this sorted out in some way, shape, or form. That's the problem. And what the, and the thing is, what he'll never sort out unless uh, unless there are is it criminal investigations and people, not just a guy hauling the the, the ballots in at three thirty in the morning, he certainly goes to jail. But the ones higher up, as high up as you can go, until that is done, this cloud is going to hang over the country indefinitely. No one is going to believe in the integrity of elections if they could get away with this. And then that undercuts what all of the uh, <laughs> to use the, to use the cultural Marxist proposition that undercuts all cultural optimism. Mm-hmm. All right? Oh my God, we're in a situation where the, the future is dark and dire and dim and so forth and so on. And you know the, that was the whole point of the cultural Marxist uh, theory of attacking society. You know, they said. Marx said, in the sequence of historical determinism, you would get to the point where the two con- conflicting classes were the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, the workers and the employers, the capitalists. And they would struggle for control. The pro- proletariat would win. It would establish its own dictatorship. It would eliminate the bourgeoisie, and we would be in the final stage of history, after which nothing would ever change. We would have socialism slash communism, and everything would be perfect. Okay, and what happened? Well, the proletariat, instead of following the Marxist pattern of historical determinism, said, "Well, we can work within the political process. We can obtain what they call labor legislation, mm-hmm. workplace safety, limitation of hours, uh, minimum wages, uh, overtime pay, uh, and we can also engage in collective bargaining through unions and so forth. There are all sorts of things we can do that we don't need to turn to violent revolution. And so the Marxists now suddenly realize, hey, we're out of business, because the proletariat, which was supposedly the force that was going to lead to communism, has now turned on us and become part of the bourgeoisie. This is no good. 
So they came up with a cultural Marxist theory. Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci, the Italian communist, was the one who was always quoted for the, the phrase, the long march through the institutions. And the communists realized, oh, what we have to do is to get our people into all of these institutions, economic, political, social, cultural, and use our influence to criticize bourgeois society, modern, western bourgeois society, uh, in every possible way, so that eventually people come to look at their own culture, their own economy, their own political system with disdain and hatred. We want to, it, it was Billy, Billy Munzenberg, who was the head of the common turn, who said, our, our goal is to make Western civilization stink. Turn people against their own cultures in every way possible. So that what would happen? Instead of being optimistic about the future, people would become extraordinarily pessimistic about the future. We're living in a society that can't function properly. Oh, this is terrible. What, 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 what must we need to do? We must need to turn to Marxism. This was the theory. Hmm. A pretty stupid theory. But this was the theory. And the, the interesting point is they've succeeded. And this election, this fraudulent election, is one example of doing precisely that. Whether this was the intention of the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, or the media, whatever, this is the result. That they have now put us in a position where we are going to look at the electoral process with despondency. This doesn't work anymore because it's all fraudulent. And there's no way we can know that it's fraudulent because the media is covering up, blah, 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 and all the, you know, you, you put all these things together, and the average person looks at his shrugs his shoulders and, and he goes into a kind of cultural despair. Will he then turn to Marxism? I don't know. He'll turn to whatever is given to him, which will probably be something along the line of Marxism because that's the ideology that is apparently in control of the universities, apparently it's in control of the media, apparently it's in control of the Democratic Party. And a large segment of the Republican Party, too, I would say. They don't understand it, but that's what they are. And so the thing has worked out beautifully. And this is the final nail in the coffin. When you look at the legal system and you say the legal system cannot be run legally. Or the other side of the coin, the legal system can't be run through fraud, which is the same way of saying that it can't be run legally. It can be run through fraud. You think a legal legal uh, uh, axiom fraud vitiates all contracts, right? Mm -hmm. If fraud is involved, you throw it out. If some of your ed evidence is fraudulent in a case, the judge can instruct the jury that the jury doesn't have to believe any of your evidence because you wouldn't have put up fraudulent evidence if you believed that any of your evidence was any good. That's called the spoliation of evidence doctrine. Okay. So you look at the, the legal system in this country looks upon fraud and says, well, fraud is the one thing that undermines everything. If fraud is involved, forget it. So here we now have a, a, an electoral system which apparently, oh, they're going to get away with it. <clears throat> unless, unless what? Unless, uh, and I shouldn't say Trump, it's not Trump, it's the it's legal system itself. It's Trump, it's the Department of Justice, it's the courts, it's the state legislatures. Unless they stand up and say, no, we will not tolerate fraud in this. We're going to, we're going to root this out. And if that means that the top uh, honchos in both parties have to go to jail. Well, that's what it means. Now, I haven't, all I'm saying is I haven't seen that determination coming out of, the, certainly not coming out of the Democratic Party, because they're very happy with the vote count just the way it is. Yes. But certainly not coming out of the uh, Republican Party, out of the Trump people, other than maybe Sidney Powell, who was, came out the other night and said she knew of 400,000 votes that were highly questionable. Yes. But you look at Sidney Powell. Sidney Powell came in at the, tail, at, the, excuse me, at the tail end of the Flynn debacle and did what any good lawyer should have done and was successful and pulled out all of this evidence that had been withheld. Where is Flynn? Mm-hmm. Has he been exonerated? Is he, uh, you know, walking free? with his head held up high, ready to sue all these people in the DOJ who ran this frame-up against him? No, he's still being persecuted by Sullivan, the judge. Right? Even with Sidney Powell proving the existence of the frame-up, 
the victim is still being persecuted. Now, you wonder, did the cultural Marxists succeed? And I would say, yeah, pretty much so. Because I look at this and I say, if I didn't have you know, a stubborn streak in me, maybe I would despair. Personally, I would despair. So nothing can be done here. This is impossible. We've lost. It's gone. The terminal illness. You mentioned terminal illness. The Elizabeth Kubler-Ross grief cycle of five stages of death and dying. And a lot of what you've been saying is making me think, are we in the denial phase still? Certainly some people are in the anger phase. Some people are in the bargaining phase. But you're, you're talking about the goal is to get us to the depression phase and then the acceptance phase and just go, yeah, I guess I'll just go with go with what these powers are yeah. that be. Hope I get something, some gravy out of it. Yeah, well, that's, that's basically it. I mean, it's a, it's a, a simple-minded psychological assessment. If you drive people to a certain point, and they'll shrug their shoulders and say, yeah, do to me whatever you want to do. I'm not going to resist it anymore. I'm simply going to accept it. All right? And the communists understood this. And how, how do you do it? Well, you undermine the faith that the people may have in the stability of the systems that exist. And you show them there's no way out within these systems. That's the important part. There's no way out within these systems. Uh -huh. You have to opt for some other system that we are going to give you. We, the manipulators, are going to present to you. It's not enough for us to criticize. And hopefully you won't remember the Declaration of Independence option, which you had already proven. Well, that's the next stage. See, that was the stage of the Founding Fathers, and they say this. They say, well, in the Declaration, they say, well, we petitioned, right? We went to the king, we went to his ministers, we even went to the British people themselves in an attempt to get them to see things from our perspective and to maintain what we believed were the rights of Englishmen here in the colonies, which we, were, we believed we were being deprived of. And all of those petitions failed. That is, within the British system, the British legal system, there was no recourse after a certain point. Right? The king and his ministers, and even the, you know, the average Briton, weren't going to pay any attention. And quite the opposite, they were going to send Hessians over to conquer the colonies. Then what was the alternative? Well, you stepped outside of that system. That was the Declaration of Independence. Right. The old system didn't work, and we're going to declare independence from that system, set up our own system, which supposedly will be better. Although one wonders now, looking at you know, what we're seeing today, is it, has it really turned out that way? But in any event, that was a theory. So if the constitutional system is essentially destroyed as a result of these practical steps, because underlying the whole bloody system is the legitimacy of the election, if you have a bunch of usurpers, ineligible individuals in office, then what's going on? Well, they can't exercise these powers, but they're in office exercising these powers. So you have this contradiction. So what does one do? Well, either you correct it within the system, but you can't correct it within the system if the highest offices in the land and all the bureaucracy is controlled by the usurpers. You have to step outside of the system. You go to the Declaration of Independence situation, as I like to call it. We've done everything we could do within this system. They've destroyed our ability to control through this system. Well, then we have to step outside of the system. And then all bets are off. Who knows what comes out of that? I mean, we had one example was, of course, the, the founding fathers and what happened with them, but there's no guarantee that that same thing would happen again, that you'd go from a bad system to a better system. Mm -hmm. You go from a bad system to a worse system. That's also possible. So that's why I said the, Democrat, the Democratic Party people who have this very, very short term, this is childishness. This is like the two-year-old who's only interested in what's happening in the next five seconds in his life because he has no long-term vision. And that's what these people are doing. They have a very, very short-term vision. Leave aside the ones who may you know, be really nefarious individuals. The average politician in this situation is very sure, oh, we've got to win this election in any way possible. Mm -hmm. Even if that results in uh, you know, tainting the legislature, tainting the courts, whatever, tainting the electoral officials. We've got to win this election. They don't think about what the consequence is. It's the two-year-old doesn't think about the consequence day after tomorrow. 
or even maybe this evening, if he drinks the whole bottle of cough syrup, which has, you know, the nice cherry flavor. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we have. We have a bunch of two-year-olds in control of the situation now by happenstance, and they're working their will. And father, the father figure, <laughs> who is Trump, apparently is completely feckless. And his advisors don't want, don't want to bite the bullet. They don't want to come face-to-face with a Gordian knot and say, well, we have to cut this thing. Because if we don't get control of it now, then we've lost control of the whole system for the future. No one is going to be able to, to regain control within this system. Now, I would just like someone to come forward and, and, and give me an example of what, say, some of these South American democracies or even European countries where they've once gone to a violent change of the government or a fraudulent change of the government, yes. and they have then reverted to a legitimate government without going through some horrendous crisis, maybe a civil war, maybe an international war, whatever. And, of course, we have you know, terrific potential conflict with China internationally. And now they've elected someone who may be uh, compromised by having taken Chinese money in his family. Or who knows what else? I mean, we know about the Chinese money. What else was there there? And this is the guy you're going to put in as president because of your short-term view as a member of the Democratic Party that you want the Democratic Party to be in control? You're going to put in a guy who has... uh, Perhaps have Alzheimer's or some other mental condition, and he has, you know, he's compromised because of connections with Chinese money. And you can put him in as president just so that you can get Trump out, you know, destroy the country. That's where the word treason comes into play here, right? Giving comfort, aid and comfort to the enemies of the United States. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not looking to say, oh, well, the Democratic Party is engaged in treason. I'm just looking at the long-term consequence of this thing. And you start thinking through, well, what, what about this, what about this, what about this, what about this, in a chain of events. And you say, oh, yeah, there are all of these very dire possibilities. And that's why when you see a, tw- a two-year-old child with a bottle of cough syrup, cough syrup what do you do? Take it away. You go over and you yank the cough syrup out of his hand before he drinks it. You don't say, well, Billy, go ahead and drink and see how well you feel tomorrow morning. As if that would be a lesson to a two-year-old child. They could make the connection, the logical connection. No, you go over and take the cough syrup out of his hand. You impose a a kind of legal system on him. The superior figure in the political process within the home asserts his authority. And so who is the superior in the political process here under these circumstances? What is Trump himself? Right. Article 2, Section 3, take care of, shall take care of the laws be faithfully executed. Are the laws being faithfully executed? Just from the federal level, because the federal level, of course, is the only one he can actually control. And the answer is, well, no. We've got all of these uh, federal criminal problems. And if you look at some of these state problems, I mean, look at the, the, the state problem in Pennsylvania where the legislature said one thing about mail-in ballots and the uh, Supreme Court of Pennsylvania claimed the authority to say the opposite. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a violation of the U.S. Constitution because the U.S. Constitution puts into the hands of the legislatures of the states, not the courts, mm-hmm. the authority within the electoral process. So even that he could step in on. He doesn't have to wait for the Supreme Court of the United States. You tell me that he can't directly enforce the Constitution under a number of statutes, a couple that I mentioned earlier in, in this discussion. He hasn't. And that's what's amazing because that's what Rose, Franklin Roosevelt did. Quite obviously, he stepped forward in the earliest days of uh, his administration, especially dealing with the banking problem. And he said, oh, I have this authority. Here's a statute that says so, and I have the authority to execute the laws. And here's a proclamation that I'm writing to close the banks. 
Well, you look at that and you say, well, that, yeah, that seemed to be a rather, rather radical thing for him to do, but he had the authority to do it. At least no one has ever said he didn't have the authority to do it in principle. Now, is, is that more radical? Is, is, a, is a banking crisis, which we eventually got over, an economic crisis, that kind of, a, a more radical situation than an electoral fraud that destroys the legitimacy of the entire bloody government? So one would think that some people in the Trump administration would remember Franklin Roosevelt. He was elected president four times, as I recall. He wasn't a minor figure in American history. But apparently not. They haven't thought about that. And so here we are, and I, I look at this and I say, oh my God, this is like the last days of the Roman Republic if it goes in one direction. If it goes in the other direction, well, we, we may fester on for a while. We'll have to see. But unless it goes in the third direction of stamping this out, and maybe I shouldn't say stamping, you're not going to stamp it out. The evil in the hearts of men is always there. But in this particular instance, making an example, then that's the end. If they get away with this, they can get away with anything. Every election will be like this. Mm -hmm. And then that, that's the end of the constitutional system. It has nothing to do with overthrow of the Constitution. It has to do with you know, usurpation. Constitution is still there, but it's a... You know, it's a fig leaf covering up this criminal conduct. And then half of the, and to get back to my other point, the half of the American people do not accept this. All the people who voted for Trump, I think, clearly do not accept this. So now you've divided the country in a, in a manner that is irreconcilable. Where does that lead? Some say to civil war. Well, uh, yeah, this, uh, but the, the, the war that occurred in 1861 was possible because there was a clear geographical division. There were the slave states, and then there were the non-slave states, and then there were the border states. Some went one way, some went the other. So you could see that. What would it be today? I mean, the, the, these divisions are within cities, Counties, towns, families. Yes. What would it look like? I think of Virginia as a kind of a classic example of this because you can actually draw some geographical lines. If you draw a line down from D.C. along the coast of, of Virginia, the Atlantic coast of Virginia, you pick up most of the heavily Democratic areas. Uh, all of the bedroom communities outside of D.C. come down to Richmond, which is the capital, go down towards uh, the big uh, naval bases, Hampton Roads and so forth. And then there's the rest of Virginia. And so you have this little blue strip that runs down the coast, and then you have the rest of Virginia, which is all red, other than a few cities. You have Roanoke and a couple of other cities, small areas that are urban Democrat centers. So you could imagine dividing Virginia up. You'd have Eastern Virginia, and then you'd have Middle Virginia, and then we have, of course, West Virginia, which already exists. And there could be a couple of these little enclaves that would be connected to Eastern Virginia that would be in the center of Middle Virginia. So, yeah, I can see that, because uh, outside of the blue strip, to the south of Washington, D.C., Virginia was very solidly in the other camp. But I don't know about other states, and certainly that isn't true of you know, uh, Maryland or whatever, Kentucky, Tennessee. You know, how would you divide those geographically? I have no idea that, that that's even conceivable. So we have this difficulty. You have within the society all of these groups, or these two, two big antagonistic groups, and how do you reconcile them? How do you reconcile a group that says we're perfectly willing to engage in electoral fraud if it, if it uh, obtains our short-term interests, and another group that says no, we don't want electoral fraud? But see, I don't care. If it, uh, I don't care. I don't think you care about Trump and Biden. That's not the overarching okay, two principle. Figures. Yeah, there's, there's a much bigger yeah, principle at play. Yeah, there's a big, much bigger principle than Trump or Biden. And so you could reverse those people and put Trump on the Democratic side and Biden on the Republican side. It wouldn't make any difference to the principle. 
It has nothing to do with personalities. It even has nothing to do with their policies, politically speaking or economically speaking. It has to do with the survival of the underlying system, of the foundational system. You destroy the foundation, the whole edifice collapses with it. And that's what they're doing. In that hypothetical that you proposed of what do we do as a, as a people divided, is if it's true that the halves are half who believe in the rule of law and half who do not adhere to the, the restrictions of the Constitution or the restrictions of, of an orderly society, or the restrictions of rule of law. Well, yes, yeah, certainly, and especially if public officialdom, which is supposed to be on the side of the rule of law, either stands aside or sides with the people who are against the rule of law. If you look at all of these, Portland, look at Portland, Seattle, you name uh, New York, yes. L.A., I mean, all sorts of cities that engage in these uh, riotous events, in which what happened? The local officialdom stood down. Yeah. Maybe they didn't exactly side with the rioters, but they certainly didn't protect the local businessmen and so forth from yes. the looting and right. destruction that went on. So now what do you say about that kind of a situation if it develops across the country? Oh, my goodness. How, how do you correct that situation? That's why I say these are unprecedented uh, events, because not only do we not, did we not have them in the past, we really don't have any idea how to deal with them if they occurred in the future. Well, I think they're not entirely unprecedented, because you pointed out that there have been some really horrific stories of uh, either Central or South American countries and other empires in the past where, which have fallen. Yeah, but not correcting them. They've been that, you're exactly right. They're horrific stories. These things went bad, and they went bad to a destructive end. Yes. And they still haven't corrected them. Right. Look at all these South American countries. Name me one major South American country that has a stable constitutionalist government in favor of human rights. Name one. Well, there you go. You can't name it. Right? They've gone through all this turmoil. Leftist governments, right-wing governments, military coups, military juntas, back and forth, up and down, and they're still in that mess. Whatever kind of government they may have, in principle, in name, they're still in that mess. And so I look at this and say, well, we are on, like on the edge of the precipice. You go over the edge of the precipice, and it's a long drop down. Apparently there's no bottom. Because you look at the South American countries, well, there's no bottom there, clearly. I was hoping you could give us some suggestion of what an ordinary person who is gravely concerned about this, highly motivated for the good of their family, their children, their grandchildren, our nation, can do at this time. Well, I think you've got to go back to... <laughs> uh, and I don't want to put this in a kind of militaristic and... and um, uh, uh, Civil War context. You've got to go back to the principles of here in Virginia. It's Article One, Section Thirteen, the U.S. Constitution, Second Amendment. What does it say? What it, What is necessary for the security of a free state? What is necessary for the What is the natural uh, defense, natural, proper, and safe defense of a free state? The way the Constitution of Virginia well organized militia. Thing. Well-organized militia. And we're not simply talking about people with guns. We're talking about people organized in a, in, a, in a political structure, recognizing that they have the ultimate power in society. And when public officials get out of line and there's no other way to correct them, the people have to act directly. And we will come to that. That'll be the choice eventually if this goes down that road. The public officials don't correct this situation by returning to real constitutional principles and suppressing the anti-constitutional antics of others in public office. Then the people themselves are going to have to speak out just the way they did under the Declaration of Independence. And I think if anyone wants to look at the history of this as an example, forget Massachusetts because that's the example most people think of. Look at what happened in Virginia from 1773 onwards. Gives a, Virginia gives a classic example of what goes on when the, the governmental apparatus at the highest level turns against the people, refuses to listen to the people's just petitions for redress. Now, it turned out successfully in that instance, historically speaking, 
but that's the model. In addition to that, do you see, you mentioned feckless examples of people who are in positions of authority by right, but are not exercising it. Are there any standouts whom we can throw our support behind who are fighting the good fight currently? Well, no, we're going to have to see. We're going to have to see what Trump does. He's unfortunately he's the fighter we have in the ring. That's my problem. We had, uh, thank goodness, he, he's apparently uh, accepted someone like Sidney Powell, who you know who showed her ability with the Flynn case. But she's only one person. Mm-hmm. I hope she can influence some others who are already there and maybe uh, cause Trump to bring some more people in at this late date. It's just it's a good sign that. Finally, he'd listen to her, Yes, probably because of her success in the Flynn case. But once again, she's only one person. So, there's, you know, it's a sign, of, it's a sign of, of hope there. It's a little flicker, but it's better than nothing. And she has been successful with Flynn up to this point. And she's certainly someone who's not going to uh, simply roll over and play dead for them. Well, it's proving to be a, a extraordinary an eventful time in our the lives of all of us and in our republic, and we would like you to continue to be there for us, giving us clarity and helping us to see with the eyes that you bring to that uh, what's unfolding. So we'd like to have you back at your nearest availability uh, as we move forward, because it sounds like things are going to be happening a lot in the next month to two to three months. All right, well, whenever. Very good. We've been speaking with Dr. Edwin Vieira, constitutional attorney. Dr. Vieira, thank you very much for joining us on behalf of our viewers on Liberty and Finance. Okay, thank you. To acquire gold and silver, just go to libertyandfinance.com. When the main site comes up, click on Bullion Sales. That's libertyandfinance.com, Bullion Sales. You'll see my name, Donegan Kaiser, my phone number, and my associate, Kaiser Johnson, his phone number, our email, libertyandfinance at protonmail.com.